Hello, everyone. Greetings and welcome to this, the Dunamite Experience at the Dunamis Seventh-day Adventist Church coming to you straight out of uh, United States and the Brooklyn area. We are grateful today that you have joined us. If you are joining us on Hello, YouTube, everyone. greetings and welcome to we welcome this, the you. Dunamite Experience. Yes. And uh, of course, we are here to have a wonderful time in the Lord today. I want you to know we had a great time at our church today at uh, Dunamis as we served Holy Communion. And today begins uh, the month of December where we're focusing on balancing the four F's, fitness, family, faith, finance. Those are the things which we'll be discussing during the month of December. And today is the first sitting in this, the new month of balancing the F's. We're delighted to have in our midst today a noble gentleman. Uh, she is my wife's doctor from back in Jamaica, uh, a man who loves God, full of motivation. Uh, I, I watched his uh, motivational videos in the mornings, motivating the young minds in Jamaica. Uh, is of course, a medical doctor. He is also trained and is a medical uh, functional medicine practitioner the founder of the Thomas Medical Center there in Jamaica. He has served in his early life as head boy and, and in leadership in high school, leadership at the university level where he studied at the UWI. And of course, he is fired up and a powerful speaker in the areas of health, motivation, family, fitness, and even finance. Um, Well-rounded gentleman, of course, is married to his best friend and he's uh, the father of three children uh, who love and adore him. I, I, I normally watch his status as he's just proud of his family. Uh, his, his children are doing excellently as well. And so today we have in our midst Dr. Orlando Thomas, uh, a powerful man of God. And I tell you this, some of the persons I know in Jamaica who could not have gotten medical help anywhere else, and even other persons thought they could not be cured. When they went to this man's place, this man's office, they have reported to me that indeed they have experienced renewed health. Brothers and sisters, family of Dunamis, welcome to this experience as the man of God, Dr. Orlando Thomas speaks speak to us. Welcome to Dunamis and please speak to us here freely at the Dunamis experience. Sabbath everyone, welcome to Jamaica, so to speak, I welcome me to the USA. It's a little bit rainy outside, but we're feeling warm and cozy inside. Really? I to join you um, in this seminar to impart some health information. And I'm hoping at the end of this, you know, all the persons who are watching and participating would have learned something that they can add to their life to make their health and their you know, their, their spiritual life even more meaningful and, and fitness in all areas would have been improved. Um, so is this, when I go into the presentation, Pastor, or you're going to have some amount of freedom? So you're, you're, this is your time. So this is you my will, time. So I'll go right into it. Whatever you want to. And of course, we, we can feel questions as you like. Yeah, so I typically prefer questions. We feel it at the end. I have a number of slides to share a lot of information. So if you want to take pictures of the screen, I don't know if Pastor will record any presentation to share it with you. The slides that I have, I could send them to your pastor um, in the email and he could share them with you also. And you could take your own notes. Um, there are things that you might want to write down because to go through the entire presentation, again, might be a little time consuming. I am a fast speaker, um, but I'll try to slow down this evening. And as I said, I have a lot of information to share. So I'm going to speak um, for the, you know, probably first 75% of the presentation time, and then 25% will be allotted to questioning. Pastor, how much time do I have? I didn't get that part of the information. Uh, please repeat, um, Doc. How much time do I have for this presentation? Uh, the total sum is an hour. An hour. So I'll speak for about 45 minutes. So at about 4.25, okay. we'll pause and, and, and allow for questioning. Um, 
And again, screen. Okay, very good. My screen is up. So I will get into my presentation now. Just if I can get this up. Yes. Yes, as I passed, I said, I'm very proud of my kids. So here are my three kids um, at the front and center of the presentation. That's JT, Orlando Jr., a little boy at the front. In the middle is Abigail. She's now uh, 16, going on 17. And at the other side is Annabelle. She's now 13 years old. We're enjoying a Sabbath afternoon at the beach, if my memory serves me right, when I snap this photo, I remember the photo. And um, this photo really is supposed to um, remind us of when we were kids, when we were healthy, when we were having fun. And unfortunately, many of us with the passing of years and with the habits that we have picked up, we have caused our health to deteriorate in many ways. But I have the formula. I have a way that we can get back to the state of health we're in when we're young and free of illness. And I have been pursuing that dream for many years. I have been pursuing that dream because I found that the enemy has been pursuing the opposite. And the Bible tells us in John 10 and verse 10 that the thief uh, cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So if you want to allow the enemy to steal what you have, um, Christ is saying, um, I am here to restore, and I would definitely take up Christ on that offer. This journey towards better health for me started many years ago, but it was given a shot in the arm, so to speak, when I met this lady virtually, a YouTube video showing this 71-year-old Annette Larkins, who despite being 71, looked like somebody in her 30s. This was her 71 when I just stumbled across her video. And it's she in the video, you could look her up on YouTube. Her secret, she had no meat, had no dairy, just had raw fruits and vegetables, most of which she grew in her yard. And she has distilled water, a lot of which she has caught from the rain and then distilled it. And she has been able to survive into old age looking quite young, as opposed to this. This is her husband who live in the same house, but has decided not to eat her raw, green, healthy diet, but to indulge in all the offerings that KFC and McDonald's and you know the steakhouses and different have to offer. And he has not decided to exercise. Uh, he spent lots of his time watching television and watching ball and the result is at an old age when they go out people are asking is that your daughter sir or mom is that your father not realizing their husband and wife and this story inspired me to say yes i can live into my old age still looking young still enjoying excellent health and still being able to do all the things i did when i was 20 and 30. That has inspired me, and I'm hoping that this will inspire you. Um, this presentation, I had included in it um, some information about COVID-19, just as a quick prelude, because I know that is a very topical issue. And while we have um, the cases going down in the US, I know there are still hundreds of thousands of cases weekly. And there are thousands of people dying weekly still with COVID-19. Jamaica has gotten somewhat a reprieve. Uh, our case numbers are down very low. We are seeing under 10 deaths per day in our island. And so we have been um, we have been a, a quite big drop in the numbers, uh, hospitalizations and cases. And I do tests and I'm seeing three or four positive cases in my office per week very low compared to the 10 and 15 we're seeing per day at the height of the pandemic. And so quickly, I wanted to just uh, give some information to help us um, navigate COVID-19 if we would have come across it or will come across it again. So in COVID-19, most persons we know are going to be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. 
but there are a few persons who might experience severe symptoms. And we know these persons by looking for these signs, they tend to experience what we call a respiratory distress or breathing problems. So when a person is experiencing breathing problems, they might be breathing fast. Their respiratory rate um, goes over 28. They're unable to complete a sentence without having to stop and take a breath. They might be restless or drowsy. They would find leaning forward to be a comfortable position which they can catch some air. And their tongue and fingertips rarely may turn blue. They might see stiffened neck muscles and the ribs drawing in if they have no shirt on, especially in children as they try to grasp as much oxygen as they can get. And if you have an oxygen monitor, you might find your oxygen level below 94. These are some pictures of persons who are experienced experiencing respiratory distress. And the top two pictures of the neck muscles and the rib cage joining are pretty common when I see patients. The blueness of the tongue and fingertips are rarely seen with COVID-19. Um, very common with other respiratory problems, but it can occur. Oxygen monitoring that everybody really should have at home. It's pretty inexpensive. I think online you may be able to get one of these for as 20 US dollars. And it gives life-saving information about the level of oxygen in your blood. And it gives you an idea of when you'd want to go to the hospital or to the ER to get care once oxygen starts dropping below 94%. Some smart watches you know, are able to perform this function accurately. So if you do have an Apple Watch or any of the Android watches, most of them can check your oxygen level. Um, very commonly though, persons who have COVID are very worried that they might die. And so anxiety might step in and this might confuse some people thinking they're having respiratory or breathing problems. The difference is that with anxiety problems, they tongue and fingertips will not turn blue. The oxygen level will be very good at 99% or more, um, but the person might be breathing fast and may have chest pain. So if, you, if you're not sure, um, it's recommended that you do not do the breathing into a bag, which we often recommend for anxiety patients. If a bag is put over the mouth, but if you're not sure if it's COVID causing this problem, then you don't want to be doing that particular uh, intervention. The first thing that you want to do for a person who has the previous mentioned symptoms of respiratory distress is to make sure that they get fresh air. And for this presentation, I want to, I'm going to be highlighting different aspects of the new START program. The natural remedies that we want to maximize on is the same natural remedies that have been here from the coming to the church. You know, the nutrition, the air, the sunlight, we're going to be looking at how we can use those in our time to maximize our health because those are the true healers. So getting fresh air is one of the first things that you want to do as a COVID patient. And it may involve opening your doors and windows or even going outside if it's safe to do so. And as much fresh air as possible. Oftentimes, we quarantine present COVID into a closed up space, lock all the windows and doors and keep them to themselves. Um, that may be necessary to protect other persons, but it is not the best situation for the person with COVID who is having distress. They need to get fresh air. Um, getting into a, um, you know, a, kneel, a kneeling position is very helpful to improve breathing. It allows mucus that's at the base of the lungs here to actually drain uh, and free up the most alveolar rich areas of the, of the lungs. So the base of the lungs is where you get most oxygen into the blood. And that incidentally is where COVID-19 tends to attack. Getting into this position, frees up that air of the lung and you can get more air in. So once you get into this position, you cough a few times and then take deep breaths. And you could do that for five, 10 minutes, coughing and breathing alternatively to improve oxygenation. And this is very effective in the short term while you're waiting to go to the hospital um, and you're having problems. Um, if you're gonna be treated at home because your condition is not life-threatening, but you're getting distressed or you can't get to the hospital for an instant period of time, lying in what we call a prone position or prone 
testing is very effective. We actually use it in hospitals too. So a person who has COVID-19, a uh, lying position would be to put a pillow under the upper chest and one under the pelvis, leaving the abdominal area free, the life uh, flat down, and you can stay in this position for up to 16 hours per day. And this improves oxygenation and would help to free up your lungs and free up those fluids that tend to clog the lower areas of your lungs. Um, person might benefit from nebulizing themselves with Ventolin or in your case, um, albuterol, um, or using a meter dose inhaler, we call it a pump in Jamaica, especially if you're asthmatic. And this can be done using a spacer. Uh, and this is very helpful for those persons with asthma and it can buy you precious time of improved lung function while you wait to get additional care or while you're being treated at home. Um, there are some very useful home remedies that we have uh, found to be relevant for COVID patients. Let's go into the COVID part quickly before I get to the meat of the matter. And so onion is uh, a very important uh, herb or food, if you want. It contains an antioxidant called quercetin. It's abundantly rich in the skin of the onion and even richer in the flesh. So we cut up the entire onion and make a tea so you could boil a cup of water and put that water in a copper jar and add the chopped onion to it and cover five minutes. And you have an onion tea which contains large amounts of quercetin. Quercetin is a bronchodilator. It opens the airway in the lungs. It works just like how Ventolin works and it can improve the breathing almost instantaneously in a person who has COVID-19 or even asthma or bronchitis from any cause. You also find using a uh, tea made from ginger and or turmeric, contains ginger and curcumin respectively. These are powerful anti-inflammatories which reduce the inflammation in the lungs of COVID-19 patients. The warmth of the tea also helps to loosen mucus. And so this can provide improvement in the breathing uh, of persons. Steaming is also a very old tradition for sinus patients, but we found it to be very useful in the advent of COVID-19. Um, covering yourself with a towel or a sheet and making a cocoon and inside a cocoon having a large bowl of hot water steaming to which you can add mental crystals or eucalyptus oil and breathing that warm air in for 15 minutes and loosen mucus in your airways and some would go as far as say the hot steam kills the COVID-19 virus. So this is useful for any respiratory illness caused by viruses or bacteria and for sinusitis patients. And I'm um, gonna jump into one important aspect of COVID-19 that really has been lost. Uh, and this is a tragedy because we have seen something very important from the outset which has not been told to you. And that is that the death of patients um, who has COVID-19 is very much linked to not just their age and their health status, but linked interestingly to your vitamin D levels. On the slide here, we see in red and critical over here, that persons who have gotten COVID and fallen into the category of critically ill, more than half of them have critically low or very low vitamin D levels in red, 20 nanograms per milliliter or less. And persons who are severely ill also primarily tend to have low vitamin D levels regardless of age or health status. And persons who have mild symptoms or no symptoms at all, tend to be those who have vitamin D levels above 30 nanograms per mil. And this was a study done in nursing home patients, mostly elderly or persons who have underlying illnesses. And the survival rate of these persons was contingent on their vitamin D levels. And so it would have been a far better scenario, I think, if this was sold on every single person taking their vitamin D supplements and getting sunlight from the 
onset of COVID-19 when we knew this information. And so I've been taking it, my family has been taking it, and I give it to all my patients at 5,000 units per day. And these are some supplements that I recommend for general health, but importantly for COVID patients of a person who don't want to get sick with COVID-19, whether or not you've been vaccinated, because as you know, you can get vaccinated and still catch COVID. You can get vaccinated and still die. So if you haven't gotten a vaccine or you haven't gotten a vaccine and you want an extra layer of protection, you should be taking zinc at 60 milligrams, 50 to 60 milligrams per day, vitamin D at 5,000 units per day, especially you guys in the US because you know it's coming on to winter now and your sun is going very fast. You know, some of you are going to have night coming on, Sabbath breaking at five o'clock, then four, and then three, and then two, and then one o'clock in the day, you know, sun is setting. Um, so I know that your sunlight exposure is going to be at a minimum, and this is when you're going to be most susceptible. Vitamin A at 10,000 units per day is important. Vitamin C at two up to 20,000 units per day. Um, is going to be also important. Turmeric or curcumin, which you get from your curry, or you can get it in pills. I know you guys have everything in Walmart and Walgreens and CVS there now in pill form. Quercetin also from your onions or in pill form. These are important supplements to take to boost your immune system and to make you more resilient against a possible COVID-19 attack and whatever may come after COVID-19 because we know there might be more stuff coming. This is a slide that I have um, I made about maybe a two years ago when COVID-19 just broke and it had made the rounds. I don't know if any of you would have seen this, been shared widely across the internet and it's um, home remedy, home treatment for respiratory illnesses. And since COVID has become very popular um, for a person to use. So this recipe is here. You could take a picture of it and it explains how you should make it. This is one of those things that you want to make sure you take a picture of don't, uh, as you try to improve all you can do at home um, for your respiratory illnesses. So this is a very good uh, remedy. So take a picture of this and just put it for another few seconds. So your orange juice, your pineapple, your garlic, and your turmeric, onion, cayenne pepper, and your onion, all raw. Hopefully you can get them organic, as we do have them in Jamaica. Hope you can get raw honey. I know there are honeys that are not raw. Um, that's a strange phenomenon to us in Jamaica. And so you can use and make this home remedy and use it for your kids and yourself. It's very tasty. All right. Now, I'm going to get into the meat of the presentation now as we have um, time running fast. Now, this slide shows two men dressed in white coats, pictures black and white, so you would know, take it from me. They are in white coats and they have stethoscopes around their necks and one in his pocket and they are mopping up a floor that is wet and the wetness of the floor is caused by a sink to the back of the room that is overflowing. Now, as you can see, they are mopping away, but the sink is still, you would think it is common sense. If you come into a room and find the sink overflowing and flow with the first thing you do is to turn off the faucet or the pipe, and then you would proceed. You would not allow the sink to continue running, and then you start mopping the floor. That way you'd be mopping the floor even in the night and the next day. This might seem silly, but it represents the approach that we often take to managing medical problems. We don't seek to address the underlying cause of illness. We seek to treat symptoms. Mop up the floor, but the real reasons why we are sick are left unchecked. And this applies to physicians and to patients. You have a headache, you need some medication for the headache. My blood pressure is up, I need some blood pressure medication. My blood sugar is up, I need some blood sugar medication. I have a diarrhea, I need something to stop the diarrhea now. I have a you know, belly cramp, I need something to stop belly cramp. We have a pill for every ill. What if you stop? Why am I having a headache? Is it that I'm not drinking enough water? 
why my blood pressure up? Is it because of my stress level? When my blood sugar, is it because I may have too much weight on? Or I ate something that I wasn't supposed to eat? Why is it that I have a belly cramp? Is it that I have a cancer in my tummy or I have some kind of gastrointestinal infection? When we try to answer then a whole host of things happen past, and you mentioned earlier, persons come to me and they leave better when they could get well. And that's not a miracle. It's common sense medicine where I ask myself and the patient the question, why are you sick? And once we can answer that question, oftentimes therein lies the cure. So today we're going to look at some reasons why persons are sick. And it starts with your dietary habits. On screen is a very popular group of foods that we call grains, wheat, rye, barley, corn, and these form the staple, the, the most important part of many of our diets. Unfortunately, these foods are not in the form that they were, how God created them. They have been hybridized. They have undergone genetic modification. The amount of gluten that they contain have changed over time. And these foods have become disease causing. These foods contain a protein called gluten. Gluten is indigestible and it has the ability, we now know, to poke holes in your intestinal lining leading to what we call leaky gut syndrome. Leaky gut syndrome is the underlying reason for almost all autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's disease, um, autoimmune thyroiditis, um, many skin conditions like eczema and psoriasis. It is the underlying reason for many chronic pain syndrome like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia it is the basis for allergies to various foods and medications that we have on environmental allergies. And if you continue to eat these foods, it's just a matter of time before you get sick. Wheat, barley, rye, corn, different grains is the cause of many, many illnesses. So all the breads and bagels and macaronis and spaghetti and things you're eating are part of the group of foods that are making us sick. And here I have some slides on gluten. The next category of food I want to focus on is oil in a bottle. We often love oils for frying especially. When the oil is in a bottle, there are a couple of things that you want to know that happens. So you see at the top of the bottle, you have some air. And the lower the oil goes, the more the air in the bottle. Air contains oxygen, 21% to be exact. Oxygen reacts with the oil in the bottle and oxidizes it. When it becomes oxidized, it becomes a free radical causing agent and it damages your cells and ages you. It makes every cell in your body get older. You can actually hasten this process, speed up the process of oxidation by heating the oil. So when you take an oil and you fry it in a pan, you're actually making this oil significantly worse. So oil in a bottle, especially when used to fry, especially deep fried oils, is gonna be a cause for advanced glycation in products, ages, your cells. Once you continue to consume this food, it's just a matter of time before your cells starts getting damaged. Deep fried foods, especially French fries and various chickens, when you deep fry food, you cause in that food to form products called acrylamide. Acrylamide, if you do the research, is a cause of many cancers. If you continue to consume these foods, it's just a matter of time before you get sick. Acrylamide is no joke. And many of us consume these foods too regularly, too often. WHO, two years ago, sent out a new categorization of carcinogens. And a new addition to the list was processed meats. Processed meats, as in processed chicken, processed beef, processed pork. Processing of these foods cause chemicals to be added nitrates, 
and other chemicals which are known to cause colon cancer. Here's a list, the WHO list, carcinogenic foods and other substances. Class one are known to be carcinogenic to humans and they are the most dangerous. And this list includes tobacco, which we know cause colon, cause lung cancer, alcohol, which we know cause liver and stomach cancers and processed meats such as um, your sausages, your salami and bologna and your corned beef, your bacon. I know we Adventists wouldn't have the pork versions, but we have many of the chicken versions and fish versions of these processed meats and they are just as bad. They have been known to cause cancers and there are 118 foods in this category that you regularly consume. And I put it to you that if you continue to consume these foods, it's just a matter of time before you get cancer. Foods are grilled until they're black. This leads to the formation of heterocyclic amines. And heterocyclic amines are cancer causing agents that has been proven. So whenever you eat a food that is fried or grilled until those grill marks are there, you're eating and consuming a cancer causing substance. And as I said before, and you can say it with me, if you continue to consume these foods, it's just a matter of time before you get sick. Sugar is sweet, nice, makes everything taste good. But sugar is one of the worst things you could consume. So if you thought wheat, barley, oil in a bottle, real foods, deep fried foods are bad, sugar is worse. Sugar will get your body to release insulin, which we know will help sugar to get into your cells so they can get energy. But sugar is a double-edged sword. It gives you energy, yes, but this insulin it stimulates will trigger a whole host of conditions in your body, from obesity to insulin resistance and diabetes, to various cancers, hormone imbalances in women, such as PCOS, it triggers overgrowth of bad bacteria and yeast in various aspects of your body, leading to various disturbances in your mental health and thinking and your ability to metabolize and absorb other nutrients. Sugar is the root cause of many, many diseases, and you would be very much well off to avoid it, if not completely, mostly. You, you do not need sugar at all to survive. And I will tell you in a minute what you do need to get to the good part of the presentation. Sugar is the root cause of what we call the metabolic syndrome. And this consists of heart disease, which most people in America and across the world for that matter die from annually. The leading cause of death is not COVID-19. Um, lipid problems. Yes, I just want to move to that. COVID-19 did not kill most people last year. It was heart disease still. So there is still something more dangerous than COVID-19. And we are not taking the precautions against it as we should. We are consuming the foods and doing the habits that will cause us to die in even greater numbers than COVID-19 are killing people. So worldwide, we know there were about 4 million people died from COVID-19 already, or 5 million. That alone died from heart disease and more in the US last year alone. So yes, we have persons with cholesterol problems caused by sugar, hypertension, diabetes, dementia, cancers, PCOS, alcoholic liver fatty disease, or non-alcoholic. These are all sugar related diseases. Eliminate sugar from your diet and you are much less likely to get these diseases. Still a few more bad foods that I wanted to know of. Aspartame is in the category of artificial sweetener. It's a genetically engineered sugar that caused the calorie increase that you get from regular sugar. So it was thought to be a better option for you to get the sweet taste and not how to deal with the consequences of sugar, which we all know very well. But aspartame is not healthy. Aspartame, um, when it breaks down in your body, will cause you to have formic acid and formaldehyde being formed. And these are dangerous chemicals to your brain. People who consume aspartame will 
research shows that they tend to not want less sugar, but they tend to crave more sugar as it feeds the sugar craving. And it is used in many of things we consume as diet drinks. So you see something like diet Coke or diet anything, it probably contains no sugar, but an artificial sweetener. You see something more diabetic, so like mm-hmm. Lucerna, for example, a diabetic drink, it doesn't contain sugar, contains an artificial sweetener. If you see something marked no sugar added, it probably contains an artificial sweetener. And so once you see these labels, it's one of a few things that we love to slim fast, red oxygen, vitamin C, uh, lots of bubble gums and so on, contains this chemical aspartame. And it has been linked with a whole host of problems with your memory and with seizures and with migraine headaches. There are so many kids I have helped with seizures by taking them off snacks and artificial sweeteners, not because I'm a magician, but because I looked at what they were eating and modified their diet in a sensible way. And the cause of the illness being removed, of course, the disease would go. It's commonly known as sweet and low, splendor equal. These are all artificial sweeteners, which if you continue to consume them, it's just a matter of time before you get sick. MSG, monosodium glutamate, is another cause of illnesses, brain damage and seizures and memory problems. And it's found in almost 70% of processed foods as a flavor enhancer. It's this guy is under many names. You can take a picture of the screen. I won't go to all the names, but MSG or monosodium glutamate is a food that you want to stay away from. And it would mean you consuming more whole natural healthy foods in the way God intended and avoiding um, these chemically enhanced food. The most common way we consume them is in cup soups and cup noodles and, and um, microwave foods. They undergo foods you buy in the refrigerator at the supermarket and go home and microwave them. High levels of MSG, it's better you learn to cook. Meat, all of us at some point consume some meat. Meat has very beneficial properties, but meats have some downsides. And the the fish and the meat that the priest ate in Jesus' time and before is not the same meat we eat now. The chicken we eat now, for example, is fed GMO corn. Um, saturated fats are high. They have given vaccines which contain lots of heavy metals and mercury, mercury and, and aluminum. They are fed hormones allow them to grow fast and mature in six weeks and they are given antibiotics because they are living in unnatural environments. When we consume the meat, we consume all these things into our bodies. And you can imagine, I will not go into, I could spend a whole presentation on how these things will affect us, but I will move on quickly. Genetically modified foods, I'm going to skip over this because this is a whole can of worm, but suffice to say that corn, soy, many papayas and potatoes and tomatoes that we consume are GMO foods. And we are best if we could get uh, organic versions of these foods. If we're going to consume these foods, it should say organic. Otherwise, you're getting a GMO food, which has a whole host of problems associated with it. What are the problems? Well, since the advent of GMO foods, we have observed some things. GMO foods came on the scene, uh, we see in about 1990. And since then, we've seen the incidence of thyroid cancer increase with increasing use of GMO foods. We've seen bladder cancers increase as the consumption of GMO foods have increased. We have seen rates of hypertension increase significantly, paralleling the increase in consumption of GMO foods. We have seen increase in liver and hepatic cancer and intrahepatic bile duct cancer increases with increasing use of GMO foods in our population. We have seen deaths due to stroke increasing, paralleling increase in hypertension with the use of GMO foods. Kidney and pelvic cancers have increased significantly while they were trending at um, minimal rate. All the disease I mentioned before GMO foods were introduced into your diet. But since your introduction, the rates have gone up significantly. Now, these associations are not 
proof of causation, but it's quite peculiar that the rates have gone up so significantly since GMO that you have to ask the question, could they be contributing? And the answer is that definitely the research is very, very uh, strong. And if you eat these foods, it's only a matter of time before you get sick. GMO foods, um, burnt vegetable oils, burnt foods, sugar carbonated um, beverages, processed meats, wheat, rye, barley that contain gluten. If you're going to consume vegetables and fruits, there are a few that you want to make sure you get them organic. So we have been told to eat vegetables and fruits. This is a slide from the Environmental Working Group. EVG could go on their website, download their app. Strawberries, spinaches, kale, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, potatoes. These are classified as the dirty dozen. But these foods, if they are not labeled organic, what you're getting is gonna be a GMO or highly sprayed chemicalized food. So if you're gonna consume any of these foods, especially in the US, make sure they are marked organic. Otherwise you're getting a disease causing food. Non-organic versions are cheaper, but they're bad for you. These over here, you can have them organic or non-organic. Avocados, sweet corn, pineapples, these are fine to have either way, but the ones in the dirty dozen, make sure that if you're buying these, it's labeled organic. You cannot say this evening that you've been distraught for lack of knowledge. Now you know what not to eat. What are you to eat? Well, let's get into that. We know that the body needs 90 essential nutrients. They need these nutrients every single day to survive and to be healthy. How do you get these nutrients? One, these nutrients are 60 minerals, and they're all listed here. You can take a picture of this. 16 vitamins, 12 amino acids, and three essential fatty acids. These are what you need on a daily basis. If your body cannot store these, you have to get them every day. Uh, with a couple of exceptions in order for you to live healthy. Simplest way to get these foods, I'm going to be skipping a few slides, uh, is to, one, you could try taking supplements. This is for busy people who don't have time to cook and eat healthy. Supplements may help to give you some of the nutrients, but you may find in most supplement pills, maybe 20 or 30 of the 60 nutrients you need, so that alone will not be enough, but taking good vitamin mineral supplements might be an option for persons who can't get enough sunlight, who can't get enough greens in their diet for whatever reason. Um, I cannot think of any, um, but these are very important for those persons. The kind of salt you consume can also make a difference. Common table salt primarily contains sodium chloride, but there are salts such as salt and Celtic sea salt um, which contain, some of them, up to 90 minerals. So first thing to do tomorrow is to go to your local health food store or Walmart and pick up a pack of Celtic sea salt or pink Himalayan salt. That takes care of your 60 minerals for the day. So it's that simple. So to get all the minerals, use the right salt. That's number one on your list, right? making it quite simple. Water is very important. The kind of water you consume is very important, but if you have the poorest quality water, it's better than no water at all. Well water is worse, and um, alkaline water, filtered water, tap water are all good options, but you should consume water in the amount that makes your urine clear. So in Jamaica, when it's hot, we need to consume more than you guys in the winter when it's cold. So it's eight glasses a day, is a good measure, but it is not necessary. If I'm in the sun working as a farmer, I might need 12 glasses. If you're in an AC environment or in the winter at home, lockdown, in Christmas day, you might need three glasses because your body doesn't sweat and lose water very rapidly. So my rule of thumb is to drink water until your urine is clear, and that's how you know. You drink it throughout the day from time to time, as the Bible counsels us in the book of Ezekiel, and um, that will suffice. Um, could get deeper into that. And what should you eat? Well, God gave us that formula in Genesis. It says, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed upon the face of all earth and every tree which 
is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So God has given us plants as a basis for life. There is a very important plant which I must mention, and that's a moringa plant. Available worldwide, you can get in Walmart in powders and in pills and so on. You may be able to plant it in the summer or in the spring and get uh, leaves to dry and to make a powder within your nutrient or your blender. And this is a rich source of almost every nutrient on the planet. It contains amino acids, vitamins, and minerals. And it's something that you should try to get a hold of. And there are many other foods that, which I'll mention in a few minutes. What do you drink? Coconut water, lemon water, vegetable juices, green tea. Um, there are a couple of good green tea options, herbal teas, vinegar water. These are various options that you could consume. Uh, I generally recommend probably getting to the morning and having maybe 20 ounces of water first throughout the day to keep you hydrated. Coconut water have the added benefit of having it being alkaline and it being isotonic with blood plasma, it having various minerals and it being itself a superfood. I know many of you will have to drink tin coconut water, um, in, but it's better than a soda, better than an uh, alcoholic beverage, any of those highly sweetened orange juice that you get in the supermarket. These are pictures from my home, and they represent juices that we make at home. Um, this is a freshly squeezed orange juice. It is um, melon, I think, and this one is just a green juice made up of cucumbers, celery, kale. These are all done at home in our blenders and in our juicers. And these are what we have at home on a regular basis. My favorite is green juices. I use a combination of fruits and vegetables and you could question me on that later on. I'll explain why. And ginger. So I tend to use some kind of liquid water, coconut water, vegetable fruits, some to spice up ginger and lemon. And this is the ultimate fast food. Gives you all the nutrients you need per day. So that's like most of your health taken care of in one drink. This is a green smoothie. So this is a step up from a green juice or a green drink. It has in the fiber, so you blend everything together. So this one has in, as you can see here, some protein powder, has in my pink Himalayan sea salt, my flax and pumpkin seeds, my ripe banana, and some celery. And this is a meal and is the basis for my day now. Um, I have tried to have one every single day almost, if not six, five days a week at least. And this, all the nutrition taken care of in one is to consume meal. And trust me, there is no other meal that's gonna be as good as this meal. Coming and down, here are some recipes and I'm sharing these recipes with you from my, um, they could take a picture of this, of some of my own recipes that, I, that I've made so my patients can enjoy from our store. And you can make this at home using a Nutribullet. Teas that you want to consume um, is a very important to start your day sometimes. And these will give you various nutrients into your body and give you a good start to your day, whether or not you're sick. Salads are going to be important to consume and try to make them beautiful and tasty. And you try to use a combination of colors and you get your fiber in. For those of you with eggs, there's one with eggs and to add a little bit of protein and fat to your salads. If you're not gonna use eggs, you put a little bit of olive oil on your salad for easy absorption and um, try to make them beautiful and your kids will love them. Um, soups are a very good way to get in nutrients you need. So soups would include your peas and beans and so on. This one, I had some chicken foot in it. I know you Jamaicans are in here and love chicken foot. Yeah, so, um, for those of you who are vegetarians on, on, on the channel, of course, the chicken foot is absolutely not necessary uh, to have, but Jamaicans love them chicken foot sometimes. And this is a very common type of soup, pea soup, and then you have vegetable soups that you can consume with vegetables that are going to give you nutrients. We in Jamaica have lots of fruits, and you over there may have your own set of fruits you can use to make fruit salads and fruit juices without sugar added uh, with the 
fiber included, which can give you a very important nutrient load for each day you go through. And there are, of course, a variety of foods that all over the world, based on where you can consume every single day. We Jamaicans love to cook, and we love our Aki and Saltfish, love our Callaloo. Over there, you might have your cabbages and different kind of vegetables that you can consume. Another important uh, food that we consume here in Jamaica is porridges. I don't know how popular that is, but I know porridges are worldwide food consumed. Um, cereal is what many people call it. So this is what is made from oats and um, ripe plantains. And you can make it with um, various things. Um, and I love plantain, for example, that's one of my favorites. And it is a very good way. I use and use coconut milk and, and cinnamon and nutmeg and my sea salt and my pimento to spice these up. So these are foods that you can consume and make easily that can form the base of a very healthy diet. Uh, your brown rices, your stews, your soup peas, this is a quinoa salad here that I have on top avocado and quinoa and beets and vegetables with a little lemon zest on top with some peas um, cooked into the quinoa. quinoa a very popular health food north of here. And so these are healthy ways that you can consume it. And that's me having my green smoothie in my office uh, at work. Um, for those of you who are fish lovers, steamed fish is a very popular way to consume your vegetables. This is a steamed fish swimming in a bed of vegetables. So I'm just whetting your appetite for those of you who have different tastes. Um, these are snack items that are totally natural, totally um, homemade. Ice cream, this is on the right here. Um, chia pudding that I made for my wife on Mother's Day last time. This is chia mixed in with coconut milk and, and infused with cinnamon and nutmeg and sea salt. And on top we have frozen, not frozen, we have dried fruit, dried cranberries and ripe banana and um, kiwi. Over here, we have a totally raw cheesecake that I made for her birthday this year and the year before. This, the base of this cheesecake is made from dates and almonds. And um, I think there was some spices, some cinnamon and nutmeg, those spices blended and ground it together, pressed into the bottom. The filling is actually made from cashew and coconut cream. So we get the coconut milk put in the freezer or in the fridge rather overnight. And in the morning, you see the thick cream rice at the top. And, you know, you scrape it off, put it into blender with some cashews that have been soaked overnight. And you add a little bit of salt there and a little bit of stevia and you blend it out and that gets you to a thick cream. And you put that in the fridge again for another few hours and on top you lay whatever fruits you want to lay. And that will give you a perfect raw vegetarian cheesecake. So, and these are homemade ice creams, which we do sell in our store. And these are made with, again, coconut cream and various flavorings and colorings from green celery to ripe bananas to chocolate. Uh, and these are tasty ways to have God-made foods in their natural, healthy form. I'm going to skip that slide. Sunlight is very important. Give you vitamin D for those of you who have access to it. Vitamin D, very important vitamin for boosting your immune system and turn on the good genes and preventing cancers. I could spend a whole day on this. Superfoods are foods that are going to be nutrient rich above and beyond every other food that you can consume. These include aloe vera, um, honey, very important so food, bee pollen, coconut, which I mentioned before, and chocolate, um, very rich in magnesium and amino acids and various nutrients like iron. Chocolate is a must have, not in the form that we have it in the supermarket, um, but in the raw, natural, dark chocolate form or the powder, make it in your smoothies or make it in your teas or put it in your ice cream. Very healthy option, superfood. I must not end before mentioning that while foods are important, the relationship we have each other is very important. And these things will form the basis of a healthy habit and a healthy lifestyle. We have very challenging relationships that are you know, very antagonistic that could cause many to fall into ill health. Exercise um, is very important. And this is me here in the gym. 
I mean, if you know me, you know that I go to gym very often. And so, this is going to be something that you would find very helpful to keep fit and healthy. Something that you should probably try to do every single day. If you have a little bit of time, like myself, I try to, in the mornings, do a quick 20 minute workout with my abs. And in the day, I might go to the gym for half an hour. And I try to do this five, five days a week. Some days, I wake up at 4 a.m. and do a one hour exercise. And, and that's going to start my day. And I try to make time for it. Um, I'm going to end here because time is far spent and we have gone way over time. Five minutes over the time I intended to spend. So I've gone speaking for 50 minutes now, Pastor, instead of 45. And I'm going to open the floor for questions uh, on whatever aspect of the presentation that you guys want to take upon. Any questions? Are there any questions? Any aspects that you want to elaborate on, to explain better? Something that I failed to mention, I should have mentioned. I would like to know if barley is no good. Yes, as I mentioned before, barley contains gluten. And so for a lot of persons, uh, gluten will be a problematic food. So let me highlight. So we've linked gluten to what we call leaky gut syndrome. And it's a basis for diseases like autoimmune diseases, which are very common. So I mentioned lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. I mentioned um, psoriasis. I mentioned um, uh, things like um, asthma and allergies. Um, there are other diseases um, like type 1 diabetes and so on that have been linked to the consumption of gluten and its connection with leaky gut syndrome. If you have diseases like Irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or you have this in your family. Barley is going to be one of the things that will take out of your diet to get you better from these diseases. And if you are susceptible, um, you are going to want to avoid these foods. Many people, however, seem to consume gluten long term with no problems. So it seems like not everybody is affected in the same way. So there are persons who will consume wheat, rye, and barley uh, for many years and not get sick. Um, I am one of those who I've taken it out of my diet, barley, wheat, everything, and I've found significant improvements in my skin, in my sinus condition, in my energy levels. Uh, and I so, and I say, if, if you're, you've been eating for a long time and you don't feel like it's affecting you, you know, maybe try for a month or two, taking them out and see if you feel any different. If you feel fine, then I probably could eat it now and then, but consuming gluten, in large amounts over a long period of time have been shown to cause many, many diseases. So it's probably something that most of us should avoid and few of us can have every now and then. But if you have diseases I mentioned, you definitely should cut it. Otherwise you will never get better. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question. You were talking about the sugar intake. Um, I'm trying to cut off my sugar completely, but I, using um, the agave, is that something I should use? Yeah, agave nectar is um, an alternative to sugar. It's a natural sweetener, um, but it is sugar. Um, it, it is sugar, so it will send your blood sugar up and it does taste. And so I'd say to you, if you are overweight, if you are diabetic, if you are a cancer patient, uh, have bowel issues. If you have allergy problems, you may want to try and avoid agave too. The, 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 probably the better option is in terms of natural sweeteners would be to use stevia. Um, stevia seems to have less problems associated with it compared to agave. Honey is a little bit better than agave. Honey is not perfect either. Honey is a sweetener, it contains sugar, but honey contains many other beneficial properties between antiviral, antifungal, antibiotic that will naturally toxify your body. Um, but sugar is sugar. So whether it be cane juice or cane juice crystal or you know high fructose corn syrup or agave, they're all sugar. And the less sugar you consume, the better it is for you. As I said, um, stevia is a plant that tastes sweet and it contains no sugar in it. So it is an option, but 
any sugar or any sweetener you consume, it will enhance, but well, it will increase your body's crave for sweet in general. So it's, it's a wise idea to try to move towards having less and less sweeteners in your diet. And with time, you'll find the craving for sugar will go. If you find you're craving sugar heavily, it may be that you're suffering from a nutrient deficiency. So persons who are deficient in certain nutrients like chromium and vanadium will have a sugar craving. Persons who are craving for like, you know, ice, for example, may be iron deficient. Persons craving for like chalk and toothpaste may be calcium deficient. So if you find you're having cravings, you can't afford this food, maybe that you have a deficiency in a nutrient and it is driving that sugar craving. Um, so I hope I answer your question. Yeah, um, I do not have a craving for sugar, but I just, you know, it was, I just started using the agave. Um, it's about a few days now, but I okay. try to stay away from sugar, period. Yeah, so use agave sparingly, not too much, okay? Okay. Thank you. Um, there, okay, there are two questions from YouTube. The first question is most fruits are full of sugar. So which is the best? Which are the best? And the second one is, are you recommending that we stay away from wheat? These questions coming from Tanil and Margaret from YouTube. Okay, so um, there's a question in the chat. Let me address that one first. Tomato contributes to leaky gut syndrome. Someone asked about tomato. Um, tomato, if you're gonna have GMO tomato, certainly that's gonna contain um, substances that will contribute to the gut syndrome. So if you're going to consume tomato, make sure it's the organic type. Now to the questions from YouTube, um, uh, one about wheat, um, that one is an easy one. Yes, I'm recommending that you avoid wheat. Uh, so whether it be white flour, wheat flour, whole wheat, these are foods that contain gluten and the research is overwhelming that continued consumption of these foods will cause disease. Now, as I mentioned with the same barley, which is another cousin to, to, to wheat, there are some persons who seem to be able to consume it uh, and have no problems. But certainly, if you have the diseases I mentioned, autoimmune disease and bowel issues and gas and bloating and skin diseases like eczema and psoriasis and acne, if you have any kind of allergy problems, you want to avoid wheat completely. It will only serve to make your conditions worse. If you have a family history of these diseases, or if you're diabetic, wheat is high glycemic and it will send your blood sugar up significantly and you want to avoid it. Now to the question about fruits. Absolutely beautiful question. Fruits are sweet and fruits contain lots of sugar, lots of fructose. And fruits, if you consume large amounts, will give you the same effect as sugar. Um, so when we're consuming fruits, there are a couple of rules. One, you want to be sparing. So the maximum amount of fruit you should consume per day is four servings. So if serving a fruit, probably a small apple, a small ripe banana. If you're gonna consume fruits, try to have them um, first thing in the morning, we can burn off that glucose load during the day. There are some fruits that are going to be very, very bad for my diabetics and overweight patients. Fruits that are going to be sending your blood sugar up very fast in Jamaica. We talk about things like mangoes, things like um, melons are very high glycemic. Uh, fruits that are very sweet um, in general, like grapes, are going to be high glycemic fruits should not be consumed with fruit juice. Fruit juice is very bad, all of them. Um, because fruits have fiber and allow the sugar to rush into your bloodstream um, very fast when the fiber is not there. So the fiber in the fruits basically hold the sugar and allow it to be delivered to your body very slowly. So fruits, yes, they are sweet. Yes, they contain sugar, so continue them in small amounts. Fruit juices, even less. If you're diabetic, if you have cancer, you should be very careful to focus on non-sweet fruits like avocado, for example. Um, kiwi is not too bad. And there are lots of other non-sweet fruits that you can have. Banana is kind of in between. It, it has a lot of starch and sugar, and you shouldn't get up and consume five, six bananas. So moderation, 
temperance is a key. Vegetables are a lot more forgiving. You can send some a lot more vegetables without any negative effects, but certainly fruits you have to use in moderation. Next question. Yes, good evening, good evening. I uh, thank you so much for the information that you are sharing. And I've often heard that we are what we eat. Um, and I heard you mentioning about, um, you know, staying away from or, moder or you know, moder modernizing being, I forget the word, when we're eating things like gluten, wheat, I find that gluten is in just about everything. I think that, you know, it's in all um, wheat products, right? Gluten is in that. Um, gluten is in potatoes, is it? No, it's not in potatoes. Gluten is in wheat. So anything that's made from flour. Um, flour. Barley, yes, yeah, so a flour, any flour, any big products. So biscuits, right. breads, bagels, croissants, all of these are gluten containing products. Yeah. And these are things that everyone loves to eat. And they're also um, part of the vegetable family. And so, go ahead. But, go ahead. No, finish the question. I thought you were done. But okay. go ahead. So what, what happens is I know that a lot of diseases are hereditary, like uh, diabetes. Um, I heard you mention about lupus. Um, I thought about heart disease, um, you know, and a lot of those diseases are hereditary. And from what I'm hearing from you is that, um, now I, I just want to mention that uh, my mom died from lupus. That is considered to be a her hereditary disease like diabetes and like heart disease and high blood pressure and stuff like that. And when my mom died, she was 28 years old and I was only 11 years old, right? I heard you mention that uh, if you have a family history, did you mention a, a family history? Because I don't have lupus, but um, if someone in your family had those diseases, then it would be best for us um, to um, mod modify the foods that we're eating, like not to consume so much of those foods that have gluten, because then it could be possible that I could develop a lupus or something like that. Yes, so um, let me address your question. It's a complex question. So there are some diseases that have genetic links. And let me just say, lay yeah. the formation that while a disease may have a genetic link, the genetics alone does predict that you must get the disease. Right. Genetics, having been born with a gene from your mother, the HLA DQ2 or DQ8, that we call it, that will cause you to have autoimmune disease, is one contributor to you getting the disease. You need your environment to be right. You need to eat the wrong foods. Mm -hmm. You need to have the right amount of stress. Mm -hmm. And you need to have the immune system damage to, for you to manifest lupus. So, yes, you could assume that you got mommy's genetic profile, you could test also, the doctors who could do that. Yes, but so I tested and I did it. Add on top of that, if you add on top of the, 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 the genetic, the wrong kind of foods, then you increase your risk of disease this significantly. And so, yes, for somebody like you, I would definitely advise that you avoid gluten completely. Um, okay. I've been avoiding it, and guess what? I'm not actually dead. There are lots of other exciting foods that you can consume. Yes, mm -hmm. continent foods are everywhere, and they're convenient, easy to grab, but we have to be deliberate about our choices. We cannot just go for convenience. If we want to stay healthy, we have to choose properly and choose daily. Just like our attention to our spiritual lives, we have to make choice about what we do, what we think, what we watch, what we read. Same yeah. thing applies to your diet if you want to remain healthy. If you don't really care about living healthy, then fine, you can eat anything. But I'm sure that's not you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So I'm happy that you're asking the question and I'm happy that you're, like many others, are going to be willing to change. But with what I've learned here this evening, I'm encouraged to go and research. Do some research on the internet and find out what are the foods that contain gluten? What's the effect of gluten on my diet? How do I follow a gluten-free diet? Oh. And Doing that, you'll find that there is an abundance of foods on the shelf waiting for you, not gluten-free. 
Right. Now, well, this is going to be, be a careful. challenge. Okay. You, need to, that's it. you need to be careful now. Um, because the information is out and everybody knows that gluten is bad, there's a whole host of unhealthy foods that are gluten free. So my recommendation is in your dietary choices, go for whole food, go for foods in the way God made them. Don't go for a packaged food that marks smart gluten-free, so gluten-free chocolate chip cookies that contains lots of sugar and lots of chemicals and, and thinking that because it's gluten-free, it's healthy. No, healthy foods, God made them. They don't need to be in a pretty package. You eat them raw or cook them. So there are lots of gluten-free biscuits and gluten-free this and gluten-free. This is just a way to get your money because the research is proven that gluten is bad. The research is proven that dairy is bad. The research is proven that soy is bad. And so there is this gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free craze. And there are these foods so attractive. 90% of your diet should be raw or whole foods that you can cook just the way nature made them. All right? Um... I'm Thank from the Caribbean. So Hello. Yes. Hello. I'm from the Caribbean and I grew up on the farm. I know what is organic food. And I'm living in this country and I don't trust those things they say that are organic. I don't trust them a lot, many of them, because I know the things that can be organic. And everything out there you go, they say organic, organic. And I believe it's to take our money. They are doing that. Well, I think it's illegal in the U.S. to label something organic that is not organic. Uh, they have laws and there are agencies that monitor the labeling of food. So, I, I, so it, if it's labeled organic, um, I think for the most part, you could trust it. We could probably try to do is find if there's a farmer's market close to you and they tend to sell um, good organic products. Um, you could go on the same page I mentioned, the Environmental Working Group, e, um, um, EWG, and they have an app on the Play Store, on the Apple Store that you can download. And this will confirm to you whether a, a particular food is organic or not based on the brand. They have thousands of listings there. There is a group that does research on healthy foods and unhealthy foods and Environmental Working Group is a resource that you can use when you're confused. But the farmer's market is one way to go. And as I said, most foods in the US that are labeled, the manufacturers and so on have to abide. Otherwise they'll be taken to court if they label something organic, not organic. I think there are strict laws there against that. In Jamaica, it's a little more, you know, willy-nilly. You don't get taken to court for that. But for the most part, I think you could trust. If it's labeled organic and certified organic and they have the stamp on it, then it's probably organic. It's going to be expensive, okay. um, but check the website and you can get information there, all right? Okay, well, um, to add, um, doctor, I think um, in the United States, you need to do your research when you talk about organic. Um, mm -hmm. we, uh, it may manifest that there are certain um, corporations that will allow for a certain uh, level of things to happen and still maintain uh, the... The, the FDA organic, organic label, yeah, okay. label for organic. So um, when in the Caribbean, you may be able to trust those that say organic because you you will see farmers close by who are growing their crops and you know, okay, this is organic. But, yeah, uh, but they still use fertilizer and fertilizer is not organic. In the US. Okay. Yeah. All right, so um, that's one thing. Um, doctor, I heard you mention earlier with the, I think you were talking about the COVID and the sleep posture. And you you were talking about how the pillows are should be situated. And um, you said the hand should pass below. But um, I'm not getting the idea of, when you said the hand pass below, you mean to be able to freely pass below your, and so here's the slide. Can you see the slide? Yes. So this is the two position called proning. Yeah. Or um, COVID-19 patients home care. So um, no, the hands position is not so important. What is important is that the abdomen, the belly is floating in the air. So you have a pillow under the upper chest, a pillow under the pelvis. 
And the tummy area is left free to allow for abdominal breathing. So the tummy can rise and fall with breathing. So you try to have a pillow to support up here. So you're kind of suspended off the bed um, with the tummy up in the air, so to speak. So the bed is down here, yeah? Uh, and so there is that, they lie face down and you can lie in that position and the mucus collected in the lower part of the lungs can actually drain forward and some of it can be coughed up. So that's called proning. So, so the hand position is not so important. The feet position is not so important. It's where the tummy is with respect to the upper chest and pelvis on the pillow, okay? All right, thank you. Um, in terms okay. of the lupus, I I know. Oh, so hold on, hold on. Yeah, I'm just seeing what you're referring to. So, so it said the belly should be free enough to let one hand pass from below. So yes, yeah, so you should be able to push a hand onto the person on the tummy area. So there should be some space between the duct, the belly, and um and the, the bed. So okay. um yeah, so that, that's what was meant there. So there's some space. So for persons who may have a bigger than average tummy, maybe you want to put one two pillows at the chest and two at the, uh, at the pelvis to, to give that level of separation so the belly can rise and fall uh, with, okay? Yes, yes, got you. Go ahead with the first question. Yeah, um, I have a friend um, who found out that she had lupus at the age of 20. Um, it was not, um, according to her, it was not existing in her family before. Um, so would it be that there was some kind of genetic um, mutation, or mal I don't know what to call it, in order for that dupus to develop? All right, so, so let, let, let me get a little technical here for you. Um, lupus is one of many autoimmune diseases, and the genetic abnormality that causes lupus also causes other autoimmune disease. So for example, that genetic problem may not be in the family, but it may manifest in somebody else as a thyroid problem. Somebody else might get asthma. Somebody else might have rheumatoid. So it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody else has to have lupus for the family to have that particular genetic abnormality. There is abnormality that she has that she was born with, but it may have been in a different form. So it is required for you to have that, to have lupus, but it's also required for you to have genetic or environmental triggers happening. So that needs to be explored. Her genetics can't be changed, but we can certainly adjust her diet and her lifestyle and her intestinal health to try to improve her condition. So she should try, if she's in the US, to find a functional medicine doctor or a naturopathic doctor to explore what are the contributing factors to her lupus. You know, typically uh, medical doctors like myself would put her on steroids and various medications which would weaken her immune system and try to loosen the symptoms or lessen the symptoms, but they will not cure her and they will make her sicker in the long term. So she needs to look at what else can I do with my diet and my daily habits and my bowel health to try and improve and put my condition into remission. So a naturopathic doctor or functional medicine doctor in her era should be able to help her along that kind of line. Okay, okay. And what about rheumatoid arthritis? I did not hear anything mentioned about that. I don't think I heard it. Um, but is that also like lupus? Um, yes, has to be I I did mention my diarrhea at least twice. Okay. So is a member of um, the autoimmune disease family and it does have a genetic basis and it's also one of those triggered significantly by diet. I I'll give you a quick example. I, I'm, I have a patient um, who um, came to me. She's Canadian. Um, she was visiting Jamaica and somebody told her she could see me. And she, when she came to me, she was in pain. She was on four medications. She was on um, um, steroids. She was on two painkillers and she was on something uh, to protect her stomach from the steroid and the painkiller, right? And she was still in pain. Uh, and uh, at that time, I, I was just getting into functional medicine and, and I didn't know a lot. So I decided that I'm gonna do little I knew to assist her, told her to change her diet, come off flour completely, come off dairy. 
and drink green juice. Those were the three things we did. Within two weeks, her pain was gone. Within another month, she was off medication. She was still pain free. She went back to Canada and opened a health food store and started doing natural products herself. So now five years later, she's totally rheumatoid arthritis free, has a whole line of healthcare products um, because she's found them to be so effective. And she has returned to Jamaica and came to my office about three months ago and brought half a million dollars worth of products to put in my store. So that I wanted to stop these in a store because they'll be helping my patients that because you help me and not charging your cent for them. When you sell them, just give me a thing. And it was an amazing turnaround. And I've had many patients like her who just made simple changes to their diet and their rheumatoid arthritis just simply vanished. Mm. Oh, wow. That's good to hear. I hope somebody with rheumatoid arthritis is listening. Okay. Um, the, question, the question is, when someone is constantly having a craving for charcoal, that's just the burnt wood. I'm not sure if it's activated. What is the body lacking? What's wrong with the body? This question is from YouTube. Okay. Um, that's an unusual craving. I remember hearing that craving before. Um, let me, I would have to do a quick Charcoal. I think um, I, if I remember something right, it might be a micronutrient called uh, selenium. But let me just double check on that for you. Um, that one is a quite an unusual encounter. But I have I have a listing here that I want to share with you guys of food cravings. So listen up and make some notes. And doc, as I'm as you're on the matter on food craving, I know that there's some women just before their period, they have crazy craving for sugar. Is that okay. hormonal? Well, um, it can be hormonal, but it can also be um, deficiencies too that are just being aggravated by hormones. Um, here are a list of uh, food cravings that I have found and they're related um, the related um, deficiencies. So um, persons who would crave uh, dairy products like cheese and yogurt and alcohol might be calcium deficient. Persons who um, crave sodas might be C deficient. Persons who crave ice and tissue might be iron deficient. Persons who crave chocolate might be magnesium deficient. If you're craving sweets, it could be due to chromium, vanadium, or sulfur deficiency. Persons who crave burnt foods, um, toasted foods, and charcoal might be carbon deficient. And carbon is available in a number of foods. So that's very rare deficiency. Uh, carbon is the basis for all organic life. So it's a little unusual to have that craving. Um, persons who crave sweets, as I said, might be sulfur deficient. Again, persons who crave um, salty foods um, might be chloride deficient. Persons who crave um, peanuts might be niacin deficient. Persons who uh, crave breads might be nitrogen deficient. Persons who are always hungry might be suffering from a deficiency of amino acid called tryptophan, which you find in pumpkin and sunflower seeds. And finally, persons who are craving, uh, who have lots of appetite, uh, might be manganese deficient. And manganese is found in um, garbanzo beans, spinach, and um, cinnamon. Those are a list of things. Uh, but you could go on, uh, on um, Google and type in food craving charts, and you could see a whole host of other food craving listings uh, that would um, kind of help you to see what exactly you should be eating to correct your deficiency and so get rid of your craving. Um, at any time, can a craving be um, a healthy thing? <laughs> um, well, um, healthy thing, you can crave healthy stuff, 
but any food that you're going to consume in abundance is going to eventually cause problems. So mm. even, you know, water or vegetables, we don't encourage you to overconsume anything. We, we generally define temperance as the, you know, the moderate use of that, which is good, and the avoidance of that, which is bad. Mm. And so saving tends to be a sign or a, you know, a message to you that you need something um, that is um, that is lacking. And Tamara is here saying craving water may be good. Okay. Um, if you're craving water, Tamara, you know, some persons, that is the first sign that they're diabetic. Um, yeah. So the craving itself might be something good, but what message is being sent might be something that, you know, is not so good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's that's very true. All right, so I think there are less and less questions, and um, so I think um, it's five o one. No, we started from three thirty there about. We've been going for an hour and a half. We had an hour. <laughs> We've gone over time, and it's now vesper time um, here in Jamaica. So I suspect it's about the same time there too. You guys maybe past sunset already. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, I'm going to end here and thank everybody for joining and participating, those on Zoom and those on YouTube. I hope you all learned something, even one bit of information that you can take away and add to your life to make it healthier. There's one thing I did mention throughout the entire presentation. That's a very important health habit, and I'll just end on this. One of the best health habits that you could ever institute is fasting. Mm. The consumption of nothing resting your immune system, your digestive system is a very important health habit that will help you with your weight loss, with your diabetes, with your cancer, with your headaches, with your allergies. It has so many applications and intermittent fasting is one way of doing it. So I'm going to recommend that you try intermittent fasting. That's get up in the morning, drink only till midday, have your first meal at midday and you're laughing by six and have water only till the next 18 hours again. And that is a practice that has helped to transform the health of many. I want to wish you a wonderful can you, can Excuse me, can you, re, can you repeat that again, the, the, the fasting? Intermittent fasting, I tend to recommend a 16 to 8 ratio of, or 16, 18 to 6 ratio sometimes where you consume water only on rising in the morning until 12 midday. So you have breakfast skip breakfast your first meal your breakfast is at midday and your last meal is at six so between 12 and six you consume your two or three meals and you have nothing after six besides water until the next day at 12. so you give your system 18 hours of rest you can do that every day or you can do that three days a week and occasionally you could do a one day water fast you could get up on a Saturday morning and say okay for today i'm going to just water fast and have water alone I guarantee you, you will not die. Jesus did it for 40 days. You're mm. just doing it. Amen, amen. All right. All right, uh, Doctor, we want to really thank you for the wealth of information. You're really um, blessed with a lot of information and uh, some of them, I believe that you have helped a lot of people to come back to wellness. And that's, I believe, what God wants for each one of us as he says in John, um, to, for us to be prosper and be in good health as our soul prosper. And so, Doctor, we really, truly thank you for stopping by and, and blessing us with uh, the, the medical aspect, the right arm of the message that we believe in. And that we, as we, as Dunamites and the visitors that are, uh, has joined, we are encouraged. I believe we're encouraged. I'm encouraged. I, I am desiring to start doing that same um, exercise we dream like you practice. Um, I look at you and I see that you look like you're in your 20s, but I know you're not in your 20s. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> right. So um, truly God has blessed you. And um, I pray that God will continue to bless your ministry as you take care of those who come into, he, whom he directs into your path um, to help towards wellness and strength. God bless you, doctor. All right, we really appreciate you. God bless. All right, so um, 
for those of us, uh, we truly want to thank you for stopping by and for being encouraged to listen to uh, Dr. Orlando Thomas. And uh, you have heard the word. Please spread it. Um, this will be on YouTube. We are encouraged to have even the visitors join um, the recording and uh, they will hear this um, information and we'll be blessed by it. And also next week, next week, we will have um, Maureen Kelman. She is an associate stewardship director in Linden Seventh-day Adventist Church and uh, associate actuary. So she will be bringing to us um, some information about faith and the finance. So we're looking forward. Um, for next week, as we come back at 3.30, um, invite your friends, your loved ones, invite um, your associates, your co-workers, invite those who you believe are struggling with their finances and uh, how to exercise um, faith to return faithfully uh, a tithe and uh, offering unto our God. Uh, you know that we will be blessed. Amen? So we're looking forward for that. Until then, we want to say, continue to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. This is a place where you will receive uh, not only information, but you will be inspired. You will be motivated. You will be uplifted to move on in life, uh, not only for your own good, for God's glory and for the benefit of others. Continue to be of good cheer. Because God is with you. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you too, Brother Harris.